everyone, Nurse Jenny here from Nurse Life Academy, and I'll be reviewing questions and concepts related to cardiology that you must know for the CCRN exam. We will be going through questions and rationales, and if you feel comfortable with the questions and rationales, I will time mark this video so you can move on, but if you answered incorrectly or you just want some extra information or clarification on something, I do give brief overviews on important topics pertaining to the questions. Keep in mind, this is just a review of content, so if there's anything you aren't familiar with, go back, review the information until you feel comfortable and can answer these questions correctly, because these are questions that you want to have mastered before going into the exam. So without further ado, let's get into cardiology, which I'm sure is everyone's favorite topic. Question number one. You are assessing your post-op cabbage patient when you notice their blood pressure is 76 over 62. They have muffled heart sounds, distended neck veins, and a systolic blood pressure that fluctuates with their breathing pattern. Your patient is experiencing signs of A. Ventricular septal rupture B. Dressler syndrome C. Papillary muscle rupture or D. Cardiac tamponade And the answer here is D, cardiac tamponade. So this patient is a picture perfect representation of cardiac tamponade. You have your hypotension, but also a narrow pulse pressure, muffled heart sounds, distended neck veins, and this systolic pressure that fluctuates with their breathing pattern, also known as pulses paradoxus. Really, none of the other options listed have clinical signs and symptoms associated with cardiac tamponade, but we can go through them really quickly. Choice A, ventricular septal rupture, is when you have a rupture of the septum of the heart, which is that wall that separates the right from the left side of the heart. And this rupture creates a hole in that wall, which leads to oxygen-rich blood shunting from the left side of the heart to the right. So now you have this oxygen-rich blood, which is going back into the lungs instead of going out to the body. And it's most likely associated with anteroseptalamize, but the signs and symptoms that you'll see are a systolic murmur at the left sternal border specifically, shortness of breath, an S3 heart sound, which is indicative of fluid overload, and crackles. So you don't see any of those symptoms with this patient presented here. Choice B is Dressler syndrome. This is a pericarditis, which happens post MI, and there are no symptoms associated with pericarditis, no nonspecific ST elevation, no pain on inspiration that's better leaning forward, nothing like that that we see here. And choice C, papillary muscle rupture. This is seen in inferior wall MIs. The patient certainly will present with hypotension, but they'll also present with crackles, as well as a systolic murmur at the apex of the heart, none of which you see listed here. So again, this is picture perfect cardiac tamponade here. So let's talk a little bit more about cardiac tamponade specifically. You will absolutely want to memorize Beck's triad, which is hypotension associated with a narrow pulse pressure. The narrow pulse pressure is when the systolic minus the diastolic blood pressure is less than 30. Another part of Beck's triad is muffled heart sounds, and the third part is JVD. In addition to Beck's triad, there are other signs and symptoms that should alert you to cardiac tamponade. If you see pulses paradoxus, this can be seen with an arterial line as a decrease of greater than 10 millimeters of mercury in the systolic blood pressure during inspiration, you should think cardiac tamponade. If you're asking why pulses paradoxus happens, the reason for this drop is because when you breathe in, the inspiration increases your thoracic pressure. But when you have fluid surrounding the heart, such as in the case of cardiac tamponade, inspiration decreases that venous return to the heart, and that's why you see the systolic blood pressure decrease. 
Other clinical signs might be a widening mediastinum on the chest x-ray. You could see a drop in chest tube output, tachycardia, restlessness, and if you do have a pulmonary artery catheter, you'll see an equalization of your CVP, your diastolic PA pressure, and your PAOP. When it comes to treatment, most patients presenting with cardiac tamponade on the CCRN will be post-cabbage, and if that's the case, then returning to the OR to drain that pericardial fluid that's accumulated is going to be the immediate intervention. You can give fluids and blood products, you can start pressors, but a patient with cardiac tamponade will be hemodynamically unstable and you will need to return to the OR. If this is a medical cardiac tamponade, emergent pericardiocentesis would be the indicated treatment. Question number two. Your patient had an acute MI with ST elevation in leads two, three, and AVF two days ago. The patient is now increasingly dyspneic, restless, diaphoretic, and hypotensive. An assessment reveals the development of a new loud holosystolic murmur at the apex. What is the most likely cause of the patient's deterioration? Is it A, acute mitral regurgitation due to papillary muscle rupture, B, ventricular septal defect, C, left ventricular failure due to restenosis of the RCA, or D, right ventricular failure related to a right ventricular MI? And the answer is A, acute mitral regurgitation due to papillary muscle rupture. So what kind of myocardial infarction are we dealing with here? You see ST elevation in leads 2, 3, and AVF. So this is an inferior MI. I think about it as AVF inferior. Gotta memorize that. One huge clue to the answer being papillary muscle rupture is the hollow systolic murmur at the apex of the heart. So this is a big giveaway. Did anyone happen to choose ventricular septal defect? It is a good guess, but remember with your ventricular septal defect, you're going to hear that systolic murmur at the left sternal border of the heart and ruptures of the septum are generally going to be associated with anterior septal MIs. As for C, this picture really isn't one of left ventricular failure. A systolic murmur at the apex is not associated with LV failure. And although D, right ventricular MIs are associated with inferior infarctions, the clinical picture is not one of RV failure either. Just as a side note, I do have a nice little chart later on in the presentation depicting MI locations with their respective EKG changes, their affected coronary arteries, and some special information which helps keep everything in line. If you become familiar with that chart, it will help you immensely on the CCRN. All right, let's dig a little bit deeper into papillary muscle rupture. So we know that the papillary muscles help attach the mitral and tricuspid valves to the walls of the ventricles. So when you have an MI, you are not receiving adequate oxygenation and perfusion to those tissues and heart of the muscles, and that can lead to papillary muscle rupture. And once those muscles are ruptured, they can no longer prevent the backflow of blood through the heart. And that's where you get the regurgitation, otherwise known as insufficiency, and that new hollow systolic murmur at the apex. You will see hemodynamic instability with these patients as well, some dyspnea, fatigue, and symptoms of heart failure since that left ventricle is not working well. Papillary muscle rupture is diagnosed with an echocardiogram, as are almost all valvular dysfunction, which is something you guys should know. So aortic stenosis, aortic insufficiency, all these valvular dysfunctions are diagnosed with an echocardiogram. 
Your treatment here is going to be emergent surgical repair of the affected valve in order to prevent further cardiac damage and death. And one extra tidbit I wanted to throw on here is that if you do have a PA catheter and the balloon is inflated, in the setting of mitral regurgitation, you will see large V waves appear on the PAOP tracing. That's due to the backflow of the blood into the left atrium. So large V waves on PAOP tracing equals mitral regurgitation. Question number three. Your patient was woken up from his sleep experiencing chest pain. You do an EKG which shows normal sinus rhythm with ST elevation in leads V1, V2, V3, and V4. Within 10 minutes, the patient states that his chest pain has resolved, the EKG is still connected and shows normal sinus rhythm with no more ST elevation. 10 minutes later, your patient experiences chest pain again and ST elevation is present. What medication do you anticipate the doctor ordering? A. Nitroglycerin and alpha adrenergic blockers. B. Nitroglycerin and cholinergic agents. C. Nitroglycerin and beta adrenergic blockers. Or D. Nitroglycerin and calcium channel blockers. The answer is D, nitroglycerin and calcium channel blockers. So your patient gets woken up from his sleep. He has this chest pain, but then it goes away and then it comes back again. And when it is there, he does have this ST elevation. When it's not there, he doesn't have the ST elevation. So what is it that we are dealing with here? And the answer is Prince Metals Angina or Variant Angina. So this is a type of unstable angina that is due to coronary vasospasm. And vasospasm is just what it sounds like. It's a spasming of the arteries which restricts or sometimes even stops blood flow through the arteries. This is not good because without blood flow, you're going to have cell death, tissue death, and lots of problems. So it is important to recognize the signs and symptoms and treat accurately. With Prinz Metals Angina, we will see chest pain that occurs at rest or when sleeping. It may be cyclic, meaning it will occur at the same time each day. One giveaway that it is Prinz Metals Angina is the fact that ST elevation will be present with pain and symptoms, but when those symptoms go away, just like in our question scenario, your ST segment will return back to normal. Additionally, troponins will be negative. And how do we treat Prinz Metals Angina? So we will give nitroglycerin, just like we would in a typical MI, but we will also give calcium channel blockers. And the reason for that is calcium channel blockers help relax the smooth muscles and open the arteries. So if your arteries are trying to vasospasm, those calcium channel blockers will work to keep them open. As a little side note, when you have cerebral vasospasm, so a vasospasm of the arteries in your brain, which we will cover in the neuro lecture, we will also be treating these patients with calcium channel blockers, specifically nemotipine. Question number four. A 70 year old male is admitted complaining of chest pain and shortness of breath. ST elevation and T wave inversion are seen on the EKG in leads V2, V3, and V4. Which heart block would most likely be seen with this patient? A first degree, B, second degree type 1, C, second degree type 2, or th D, third degree complete heart block? And the answer is C, second degree type 2. So what kind of MI are we dealing with here? We have ST elevation and T wave inversion in leads V2, V3, and V4. So this will be your anterior MI. 
and this is generally due to an occlusion of your left anterior descending artery or your LAD. It is important to know because your LAD supplies the bundle of Hiss, and we do know that the bundle of Hiss helps carry electrical impulses from the AV node down to the ventricles. But because of that infarction, those electrical signals might be blocked from progressing down to the ventricles and would result in missed heartbeats or your second degree type two. Digging a little bit deeper on anterior MIs, again, your anterior MIs will have ST elevation in V1 through V4, and they are associated with the LAD, or the left anterior descending artery. Anterior MIs are certainly at risk for left ventricular failure, cardiogenic shock, and they may develop a second degree type 2 AV block or a right bundle branch block, which is an ominous sign. Our treatment here, as well as with all myocardial infarctions, is going to be reperfusion by PCI. So get that artery open and get that blood flowing as soon as possible so that you minimize the risk of myocardial tissue death. And if you're walking into the ER with a STEMI, gold door to balloon time is less than 90 minutes. If you do happen to have a second degree type 2 block from the MI, of course you want to take them to the cath lab for a PCI, but if they're symptomatic, in the meantime you can do transcutaneous pacing. And like we've talked about a couple of times already, but just really wanting to reinforce this, with anterior infarctions, you are at risk for ventricular septal rupture. So if there is a development of a new systolic murmur, again, at the lower left sternal border, that should alert you to a possible ventricular septal rupture. Question number five. Physical assessment findings that are indicative of a significant right ventricular infarction would include A. By basilar crackles B. Flat neck veins with the patient in semi-fowler position C. Jugular venous distension or D. Tachypnea and frothy sputum C, jugular venous distension, or JVD. And why is this the right answer? So if you have a right ventricular infarction, and it's large enough to cause RV failure, it's going to cause a problem with RV emptying that's going to lead to a backup of blood with an elevated right atrial pressure. And this backup of blood into the venous system is what causes your jugular venous distension. A and D, those are signs of left ventricular failure because you've got wet lungs. And B is a sign of dehydration. You wouldn't have flat neck veins, you would have distended neck veins. A little bit more info about right ventricular infarctions here. So if you have an inferior MI, that's your ST elevation in leads 2, 3, and AVF, you always want to look out for an RV infarction. And that's because the right coronary artery supplies the right ventricle. If an RV infarct is suspected, you absolutely want to do a right-sided EKG because that will tell you that there is ST elevation in leads V2 through V4 with a right ventricular infarction. And there will also be ST elevation in lead V1. So leads V1 and V2R through V4R on that right-sided EKG. Some other clinical signs associated with RV infarct are going to be hypotension due to lack of that forward flow. You will have compensatory tachycardia, JVD, which we just talked about with an elevated CVP, but you will have clear lungs because this is a backup of the venous system and we're not talking about the left side of the heart. Our treatment is going to include medications that maximize our preload. So this is going to be IV fluids with small boluses 
The reason being is that you want to stretch that right ventricle with fluid at the end of diastole so that you can pump that blood forward to the left side of the heart. You will also utilize positive inotropes to increase contractility in these patients. One thing you absolutely want to know is that you will avoid preload reducers at all costs. These are medications such as nitrates, diuretics, and morphine. Very important to know for the exam because these patients are preload dependent and you want to maximize it. Moving on to question number six. Two weeks after admission for an acute MI, a 72-year-old male is febrile and complains of chest pain which is worse with deep inspiration and is relieved when he leans forward. There are nonspecific ST changes in leads V1 through V6. The nurse anticipates that this patient will most likely need treatment for A. Rhabdomyolysis B. Dressler syndrome C. Acute anterolateral MI or D. Pleuritis B, Dressler's Syndrome. If you guys remember, we did talk about Dressler's Syndrome briefly as one of the incorrect answer choices for a previous question. And Dressler's Syndrome is a type of pericarditis that is due to an immune response after a myocardial infarction. So we have signs of pericarditis, we have these nonspecific ST changes, complaints of chest pain on inspiration, which is relieved when leaning forward. That should definitely make us think pericarditis. The other answer choices really do not line up with the symptoms that are presented here. Generally, pericarditis will occur after myocardial infarction, after a cabbage, or for some with connective tissue diseases. And it's an inflammation of the pericardial sac, which is the sac that surrounds the heart. This inflammation will cause a pericardial friction rub on auscultation. Very important to remember. There will also be chest pain, which improves when sitting up and leaning forward. There will be pleuritic pain, which worsens with inspiration and positional changes. And you will encounter nonspecific ST segment changes and potentially a low-grade temp or a fever. As a little side note, you will have an elevated SED rate or an ESR, and that's a measure of inflammatory activity, which can be seen in pericarditis. The treatment here is really going to be time, and you will medicate with anti-inflammatory medications such as ibuprofen, aspirin, and colchicine. Again, we talked about Dressler's syndrome. I'm just throwing that in there at the end. Question number seven. Which of the following are predominant signs of left ventricular systolic dysfunction? A, pedal edema, ascites, hepatomegaly, weight gain, and an ejection fraction less than 40%. B, S4 heart sounds, bibasilar crackles, hypertension, ejection fraction greater than 40%. C, an S3 heart sound, new cough, bibasilar crackles, and an ejection fraction less than 40%. Or D, hypertension, murmur, chest pain, weight gain, and an ejection fraction greater than 40%. Our answer here is going to be C, S3 heart sound, new cough, bibasilar crackles, and an ejection fraction less than 40%. So with a systolic dysfunction, you're going to see a problem with pumping or ejection. So your ejection fraction will be less than 40%. So we can automatically eliminate B and D, and we're down to A and C. Now, A is giving us signs of right-sided heart failure with backup of blood into the venous system. 
So you will get these symptoms like pedal edema, ascites, hepatomegaly, and weight gain. Therefore, C is the correct answer. You have an S3 heart sound and bibasilar crackles, which are signs of left ventricular failure, which is blood backing up into the pulmonary system. I've included this very nice and easy to read picture here on the side, but let's talk about systolic dysfunction. So with systolic dysfunction, the heart muscle can't squeeze as well, so less blood is pumped out of the ventricles. So you have this ejection fraction that is equal to or less than 40%. And because that blood doesn't get adequately pumped out, fluid gets backed up into the lungs. When this systolic dysfunction is prolonged and it becomes chronic, the left ventricles are remodeled over time and they become dilated. That leads to even worsening of an already poor ventricular performance. With systolic dysfunction, you also see a PMI, or a point of maximum impulse, shifted to the left because of the enlargement of the heart. There will be pulmonary edema and an S3 heart sound, which indicates fluid overload, again, because the fluid gets backed up into the lungs. And the treatment for these patients with systolic dysfunction will be afterload and preload reduction, as well as positive inotropes. So your preload reduction and afterload reduction will be your ACEs and ARBs and your diuretics and aldosterone antagonists, and you will also be using positive inotropes. I wanted to create this chart to make it very easy to visualize the differences between right-sided heart failure and left-sided heart failure, and just to reinforce one more time the difference between the two. So remember, our right-sided heart failure is associated with blood backing up into the venous system. So you will have JVD, peripheral dependent edema, hepatomegaly or splenomegaly, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and elevated CVP on the right side of the heart. You will have clear lungs because the blood cannot forward flow into the lungs. On the other hand, your left-sided heart failure will show that blood back up into the left atrium and into the lungs, so you will have an S3 heart sound, which is fluid overload, crackles, respiratory issues such as tachypnea, dyspnea, hypoxemia, cough and frothy sputum because of that pulmonary edema, tachycardia, and elevated PAOP. Again, you have wet lungs with left-sided heart failure. So right side, clear lungs, left side, wet lungs. Memorize that, and that will help you with your hemodynamics portion of the CCRN. Question number eight. Nitroglycerin is indicated for the treatment of unstable angina because it, A, increases preload and increases myocardial O2 demand, B, decreases preload and increases myocardial O2 demand, C, decreases preload and decreases myocardial O2 demand, or D, increases preload and decreases myocardial O2 demand. The correct answer is C, decreases preload and decreases myocardial O2 demand. So nitroglycerin decreases preload by causing venodilation and decreasing the venous return to the heart. The decrease in preload decreases the work of the left ventricle and thus the myocardial oxygen demand. Nitroglycerin is a potent venodilator as well as a vasodilator at higher doses. It reduces preload and decreases myocardial O2 consumption, which is important in order to decrease the amount of ischemia and damage to the heart. Initial nitro treatment would be sublingual, which is dosed at 0.4 mg every 5 minutes times 3 doses. If this is not providing relief, you should assess the need for a continuous drip. 
you absolutely need to monitor for hypotension because you do not want to decrease perfusion to the coronary arteries. This is very important. You also want to monitor for headaches, which is a common side effect. One more reminder, do not give nitro or any preload reducer to patients with an RV infarction. You do not want to decrease preload because you want those ventricles full and pumping blood forward for these patients. You also do not want to give nitroglycerin to patients that are using phosphodiesterase inhibitors such as Viagra or Sildenafil or Cialis. Moving on along here to question number nine. Which drug would most likely be given to a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? A. Metoprolol B. Digoxin C. Dopamine or D. Dobutamine And the answer here is A, metoprolol. So in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there is a problem with filling. And our goal here is to slow down the heart rate and maximize ventricular filling since it's compromised. Since the other three options have some kind of inotropic effect, they wouldn't be useful for our desired goal. So we're going to choose metoprolol to slow down that heart rate and maximize that filling time. Generally, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a mutation of genes which leads to an enlarged septum, which then results in left ventricular hypertrophy and a small left ventricle chamber size, as pictured on the left here. Here is the septum that is enlarged, causing this left ventricular hypertrophy. Some may not know that they have it, and a lot of time in young adults, they unfortunately find out by cardiac arresting while exercising or playing sports. And hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a diastolic or a filling problem. So the EF is going to be greater than 40% because there's no problem with ejection. There will be an S4 heart sound, which indicates a stiff ventricle, not to be confused with an S3 heart sound, which is a sign of fluid overload. And with the left ventricle chamber being so small, it can put pressure on the mitral valve and cause mitral valve regurgitation. Treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy includes beta blockers and calcium channel blockers to slow down the heart rate to maximize the filling time of the left ventricle. You do want to avoid inotropes and surgically, you can do a pacemaker. You can do a septal myectomy, which is where they cut off some of that septal muscle to open up that ventricle chamber size, or you can do a septal ablation. Question number 10. An unresponsive patient with a palpable pulse has a blood pressure of 71 over 52 in the following rhythm. The most appropriate therapy in this situation is A. Synchronized cardioversion with 100 joules B. Defibrillation with 100 joules C. Lidocaine 1 mg per kilogram IV or D. Amiodarone 300 mg IV The answer here is A, synchronized cardioversion with 100 joules. So the first question you want to ask yourself is, what is this rhythm on the strip? I would identify that as monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Next, you want to ask yourself, is this patient stable or unstable? And what differentiates the two? If you chose amiodarone as your answer, did you ask yourself the second question? Because if this was stable monomorphic VTAC, you could give amiodarone. However, the patient depicted in our scenario is unstable. 
and that's seen by his unresponsiveness and hypotension. And the ACLS algorithm for unstable monomorphic ventricular tachycardia is synchronized cardioversion. Do not defibrillate this patient. Defibrillation is saved for V-fibrillation because it can cause R on T phenomenon, which can then throw this patient into V-fib, and that is a much worse place than he is in right now. So remember V-fib, D-fib, but with our monomorphic VTAC that is unstable, we are doing a synchronized cardioversion. Adding on to what I just mentioned in the previous slide, knowing if our patient is stable or unstable, we're gonna look at the context and the details that are provided for us. So a patient who is unstable will be hypotensive or have a decreased level of consciousness or responsiveness, or they may be having chest pain. You will perform a synchronized cardioversion starting at 100 joules for this unstable patient. On the other hand, if your patient is stable, and doesn't have any of the above signs, the ACLS algorithm points to antiarrhythmic medications such as amiodarone. You can also do adenosine 6 mg IV push. I hope everyone is hanging tight here because we are on question number 11. Which finding is most indicative of cardiogenic shock? Is it A, an SVO2 greater than 70%, B, a cardiac index less than two liters per minute per meter squared, C, an SVR less than 1,000 dynes per second per centimeter to the negative fifth, or D, MAP greater than 70 millimeters of mercury. Do not worry about memorizing these units of measurement, just focus on the numbers at hand. Did you choose B, cardiac index less than two liters per minute per meter squared? So let's quickly go through the hemodynamics of cardiogenic shock, as this will be something that you do need to memorize in addition to all of your shock states. Let's talk about the SVO2. Is it going to be high or is it going to be low with cardiogenic shock? it's going to be low. And that's because tissues are extracting a higher percentage of oxygen from the blood than normal. How about our cardiac index? Well, we kind of have the answer here on the side. Our cardiac index is going to be low because our stroke volume is decreased. Let's talk about our preload for cardiogenic shock. Is it gonna be high or is it gonna be low? It's going to be high because blood is backing up in that left ventricle. You're going to have a high PAOP. How about our SVR? High or low? It is also going to be high. So with your preload being high and that blood backing up into that left ventricle, your body senses that there is an insufficient amount of blood being pumped to the periphery. So its physiological response is going to be to vasoconstrict, that's where your high SVR comes from, in an effort to maintain perfusion to its vital organs. And last but not least, your MAP. Are we looking at a high MAP or a low MAP? So our MAP is going to be low when a patient in cardiogenic shock is in this hemodynamically unstable state, their body is not able to perfuse blood to the vital organs because they're working overtime. So this is where you're gonna see your MAP less than 60. Again, this is something that you want to have memorized in addition to all of your shock states. I will make a presentation on the multi-system review and the shock states, which will have a very nice table depicting all of these 
We talked about the hemodynamics of cardiogenic shock, but what exactly is it? Cardiogenic shock is the most extreme end on the continuum of heart failure when your body's compensatory mechanisms fail to maintain adequate cardiac output, and this person is going to be decompensated and hemodynamically unstable. Your patient will be hypotensive with a MAP less than 60, tachycardic, which is compensatory. They will be fluid overloaded with pulmonary edema, so you're going to hear that S3 heart sound, which indicates fluid overload. They will have crackles because blood is backing up and decreased perfusion and decreased urine output. We already talked about hemodynamics, so we will have a low SVO2, less than 60 to 65%, a low cardiac index, less than 2 a high preload with a PAOP greater than 14 millimeters of mercury, and a high afterload, which will be an SVR greater than 1200. As far as treatment goes, you want to absolutely target the cause of your cardiogenic shock. So certainly if the shock is coming from something like a massive STEMI, you want to take them to the cath lab for a PCI. Or if it's from a papillary muscle rupture, let's say, you want to take them to the OR for emergent surgery. Our goal of treatment is two things. You want to enhance the effectiveness of the pump, which is done by positive inotropic support such as norepi, dopamine, and dobutamine. But you also want to decrease the demand on the pump, which is done by preload reduction through diuretics, afterload reduction, and mechanical support, such as IABP most commonly. Question number 12. The location or type of an acute MI is often associated with specific clinical findings. Which of the following statements related to the location of an MI is true? A. An anterior MI is often associated with heart blocks due to RCA involvement. B. An inferior MI is often associated with right ventricular wall infarction. C. A lateral MI is most likely to be associated with a posterior MI. Or D. A posterior MI is most likely to lead to the complication of heart failure. And the correct answer here is B. An inferior MI is often associated with right ventricular wall infarction. Since most inferior MIs are due to an RCA occlusion, and the RCA also supplies blood to the right ventricular muscle wall, an inferior MI is most likely associated with an RV infarct. The rest of the statements are not true. If you want, you can pause the video here and see if you can go through each answer and indicate why the choice is incorrect. For choice A, an anterior part of the heart is supplied by the left coronary artery. It's not supplied by the right, so that's why it's incorrect. For choice C, posterior MIs are associated with inferior MIs the most. And lastly, choice D, the MI that is most likely to result in heart failure is an anterior MI, not a posterior. Since we've talked about myocardial infarctions and their complications quite a bit, I figured I would make an easy to read chart that summarized all of the important findings here. You absolutely need to know which EKG leads are affected with which MIs, and everything in the notes section related to the MI location is very important. I'm going to move forward, but feel free to pause here, take a picture, quiz yourself by covering up a section and guessing the others, whatever your heart desires. But please, if you are going into the CCRN, memorize this table, specifically your ST elevation and that note section. Question number 13. The rhythm below may be associated with A. Dressler's syndrome B. Atropine administration 
C, procainamide administration, or D, left ventricular aneurysm. The answer here is C, procainamide administration. So again, let's look at our strip and identify our rhythm. Right here, we are looking at a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Specifically, this is torsades de Poin. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, going through choice A, Dressler syndrome, we've talked about till the cows come home. That's the pericarditis associated post-MI. And this is not a strip of pericarditis. Certainly is not ST elevation. Um, atropine administration would not present with torsade de Poin. Procainamide administration would because it is an antiarrhythmic that is associated with QT prolongation and that can lead to the development of torsades. So that's our answer here. Left ventricular aneurysm would not cause this rhythm. We talked earlier about monomorphic VTAC, so now let's take some time to talk about polymorphic VTAC. You will most likely see torsades de Poin on the CCRN exam. In our question, torsades was the cause because the patient received an antiarrhythmic medication known to cause QT prolongation. There are other medications that can cause QT prolongation, and that includes amiodarone, Haldol, and quinolones. Additionally, electrolyte imbalances can cause torsades. Hypomagnesemia is a big one, especially if you have a patient with alcoholism, they are at very high risk for hypomagnesemia. Otherwise, hypokalemia and hypocalcemia may also cause torsades, but not as much as your hypomagnesemia. The treatment for torsades is going to be an infusion of one to two grams IV piggyback of magnesium sulfate. And of course, we love to address our cause, so we will fix electrolyte imbalances or we will discontinue QT prolonging medications or perhaps just adjusting the dosages. Question number 14, which is a contraindication to the use of intraaortic balloon counterpulsation or IABP? A, aortic valve insufficiency, B, mitral valve regurgitation, C, ventricular aneurysm, or D, ventricular septal defect. The answer here is A, aortic valve insufficiency. And the reason being is if the aortic valve is unable to close completely, Balloon inflation will only increase aortic regurgitation and offer little augmentation of coronary perfusion pressure. It would actually worsen the heart failure because blood will go back into that left ventricle. So aortic valve insufficiency is a hard contraindication to IABP. So remember, we're going to use IABP therapy in cardiogenic shock, as well as left ventricular heart failure. And sometimes this can be a little bit overwhelming, but think about the balloon doing two things. It inflates and it deflates. It inflates and it deflates. When it inflates at the beginning of diastole, it boluses blood into the coronary arteries and this bolusing of blood into the coronary arteries will increase perfusion and increase myocardial oxygen supply. On the other hand, when the balloon deflates, which is right before systole, it will decrease afterload and work of the left ventricle, and that decreases your myocardial oxygen consumption and increases your cardiac output. For the exam, you must know when the balloon inflates and deflates, so it inflates at the beginning of diastole, and it deflates right before systole, but you also want to know what happens as a result of the inflation or deflation. 
So with inflation, you are increasing your coronary artery perfusion. And with deflation, you are decreasing your afterload. These are the two desired effects of IABP. Last but not least, question number 15. You are caring for a patient two hours post PCI with a stent. Femoral access and a percutaneous closure device was used. Distal pulses are 2 plus, the femoral site has no bleeding or hematoma, neck veins are flat, and heart sounds are normal. The patient is reporting lower back pain and bruising to the right flank is noted. Vital signs are as follows. Blood pressure is 82 over 50, heart rate is 122 beats per minute, and respiratory rate is 28 breaths per minute. What should the nurse suspect? A. Cardiac tamponade. B. Retroperitoneal bleeding, C. Femoral artery pseudoaneurysm, or D. Infection following invasive procedure. The answer here is B. Retroperitoneal bleeding. So let's review cardiac tamponade's Bex triad. Do we see hypotension with a narrow pulse pressure here? We do. But do we see muffled heart sounds? No. How about JVD? No, it looks like we have flat neck veins. So it's not cardiac tamponade. Is it C, ephemeral artery pseudoaneurysm? That would probably show some signs at the femoral site, such as bruising, hematoma, maybe faint or absent pulses. None of those are present here. And choice D, these vital signs may be associated with infection with a hypotensive patient, a tachycardic patient, a little bit tachypneic patient. However, looking at the bigger picture, this patient is post-PCI, we want to focus on the lower back pain and bruising to the flank, which is Gray Turner's sign. These are both very telling signs of retroperitoneal bleeding. Like we just discussed, retroperitoneal bleeding is associated with hypotension and tachycardia because of the blood loss. There will be low back pain and Gray Turner sign. There are a lot of signs that you need to memorize for the exam. So one way that I remember this is you have to turn your patient to see their back or their flank. So gray turner sign to assess their back for retroperitoneal bleeding. Treatment here would be fluids and blood products due to the volume loss and hypovolemia. You can check an h and do a CT abdomen, you can hold pressure, or you can go to surgery if necessary. On the topic of complications post-PCI, I did want to include stent reocclusion, which would be another common complication. You would identify this by a patient's return of chest pain and return of ST elevation on an EKG. And if this is the case, you absolutely want to contact the physician for potential return to the cath lab. Some findings post-PCI that may seem abnormal but are actually normal are elevation of a CK or troponin levels as well as short runs of VTAC post-PCI. And this is due to the stunning of the myocardial muscle when the vessel reopens. All right, everyone, we have made it to the end. I know that cardiology is a heavy subject and it is not easy. If you got any questions wrong, do not fret. Just go back, review the content, and come back until you've got the question right and you understand why. This is all information that you want to have mastered going into the CCRN, but you can absolutely do this. So good luck. You've got this. If you did like the video and found it helpful, please like and subscribe and let me know if you have any questions. I'd be more than happy to help and answer your comments. Also, let me know which topic system you'd like to see up next. Thank you everyone for watching. Nurse Jenny is signing off here for Nurse Life Academy. Have a good one.